Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Christopher Rocchio. I'm the author of the Sun Eater Science Fantasy series from Daw Books and junior editor at Bain Books, where I've worked with science fiction and fantasy writers for the last several years. And today I want to talk a little bit about book covers, how they get made, why they end up the way that they do. And in order to do that, I thought what better way than to go through the cover process for my first novel, Empire of Silence. Uh, the cover was done by an artist named Sam Weber. Sam is awesome. He's done work for the Folio Society on like Frank Herbert's Dune. He did Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun folios. And he's worked for Neil Gaiman and a bunch of other uh, uh, writers and publishers. And he's just one of the best. And I was really, really fortunate to get to work with him. And so I asked Sam uh, if I might have permission to go through uh, some of these old sketches, the preliminary files, uh, that he and my publisher sent back and forth. So in this video, we're going to look at some of the original concept art for the first book's cover, uh, most of which obviously never got used, uh, but we're also gonna look at the one that became the final cover and the stages of revision that it went through to reach the final stage. All right, many of you will recognize this. This is the US cover. Uh, I think a couple of the foreign translations also use this. I think the French and the Russian editions bought the rights to this art. Very often you'll see that with the uh, foreign publishers buying artwork for editions that have already been done. They'll lease the rights from either the publisher or the artist, I think usually directly from the artist, but I may be uh, mistaken about that. Uh, this is what the final product looked like. Uh, we didn't always begin with this concept. We actually started uh, with, uh, with a series of sketches, because what you'll do, um, one of the questions rather that authors get asked all the time is, well, do you get to pick the cover? And the answer most often is no. Uh, authors generally are not marketing experts. I certainly am not. Uh, but, and, and very often it, it's the case too that authors are too close to the material. They don't know how to step back and figure out what aspects of the story they're telling um, are the right ones to push, to push the novel. Uh, this at least is the thinking of a lot of publishers. Uh, I uh, did get some say in it. Not only did I get to go back and forth with the artist, but Daw Books actually asked me which artists I thought might be a good fit. And I gave them the list and Sam was on it. Sam's one of my very favorite uh, science fiction fantasy uh, cover artists. And they said, sure, let's, let's do it. Um, Later on in the series, we transitioned to a different artist, Kieran Yenner. We had some scheduling conflicts with Sam. And, and in doing a series, the, the general way of thinking about this is that you want a singular artist uh, across a series of books so that you can develop a distinctive look. Think about Harry Potter, for instance. I forget the name of the artist on that one, but the, they have a very distinctive style to them. You'd recognize that artist's work anywhere. And like I say, I don't even remember his or her name. Um, Aragon is another one that comes to mind, the YA series with uh, John Jude Palancar's work with those dragons, uh, the very iconic uh, dragon portraits, uh, monochromatic, they're very distinctive um, and they stick out really, really well. And so you want to generate a coherent uh, vibe for the series as a whole. Uh, and so when we picked Kieran with books two and three and moving forward, we wanted someone who could kind of work in the, uh, the tone and the mode that Sam had set up with this painting. Um, and so when we got Sam, uh, we talked back and forth. My editor, Katie, and I uh, we pitched a couple ideas, and uh, we sent them to Sam. And so the first sketch he gave us uh, was this one. Um, Hadrian, of course, spends some time as a gladiator, uh, and his, uh, his family's sigil is a, uh, a devil, right? It's wielding a pitchfork. And so Sam thought, hey, we'll, uh, we'll mount this gladiator helmet on a... Uh, on a pitchfork, you know, like you would mount the head of your enemy on a pike. This, for those of you who might be uh, history buffs, is sort of based on the gladiator's Thracian helmet. I have a Gallic helm uh, behind me, a bit of a Roman classicist, so as many of you will know. This is the sort of typical one that you'd see. There's a famous painting by uh, Jean-Léon Guérin of the gladiator where everyone's doing the thumbs down. Uh, that's that helmet. Uh, when I told Sam Gladiator, he went straight to it. It is the iconic Roman Gladiator helmet. Uh, we mounted it on a spike. This is uh, just a sketch. I don't know if he did this uh, in pencil or acrylic or digitally. I think it looks like it was mostly done by hand. The background might have been digitally finished. And, uh, but that was one of, of four that he sent us. The second one was another helmet. I really like this one. Uh, it's got a little bit more in common with the Roman Gallic, uh, whoops, I can't do this mirrored very well. The Roman Gallic helm in terms of the like neck flange here, although there's a little bit you'll see of the, the Darth Vader here as well. What we really wanted to get a sense with these two helmet drawings was a close up look at the technology 
end of the sort of fantasy meets science fiction vibe. You've got all the exposed wiring and you've got the antenna here in the ear. And then you've got this uh, sense of, of, of violence too and that someone's lifting up this helmet by its ruined uh, its ruined wires. And you'll notice too uh, when you're doing cover design that you want to leave space for the title and for the author's name, uh, which Sam has done very consciously. I also like that the wires here are all fiber optic. You can see the, the lights at the end of them where they've been ripped out as if it might have been in the uh, neck of a robot instead. Um, you'll also notice there's no, uh, there are no eye holes or anything. Those of you who read the books know uh, the helmets the Solemn Imperial uh, soldiers use have uh, uh, cameras that'll pipe images uh, onto uh, projectors that map directly onto the wearer's eyes. So there's no visor because visor is, of course, a weak point. You don't want that even if it's some sort of reinforced glass. Um, the third concept we had, uh, looking a little bit more familiar, this was supposed to be uh, Gladiator Hadrian in front of uh, the ziggurat on Emesh, right? Uh, so this is a look, a little, a uh, little bit of a look at, uh, at at what the architecture of the universe might have been like. We've got some spaceships flying around here. Uh, Hadrian again is dressed sort of in uh, uh, sort of Thracian gladiator fight. He's got a, a a metal sword, not a high matter one here, and he's got that that Thracian helmet again with the fin and the huge flange uh, under his arm. Uh, this has got a little bit of the like sort of classical square lines, a little bit Sumerian, a little bit Greek, uh, but then you've got the smokestacks over here and 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 the ships, and you get a, again that sense of genre blending. That was something I really really wanted to push. Uh, fantasy seems to reach a broader market, in in my opinion, and I think some of the data bear this out, than science fiction does. Uh, and I really wanted to lean on the fact that this is a fantasy novel; it just is in space. Uh, hoping to sort of reach, you know, both both sides. I feel pardon my '90s political reference. And uh, the fourth concept is finally the one that is going to be more familiar to everybody. It is. Uh, you know, the, the solitary figure staring up at the stars, uh, clearly having just uh, just conquered some foe here. You've got the hand holding the blade. This is also a reference to that Garon painting that I was talking about where the gladiator is looking on as the, uh, the Vestal Virgins in this Roman painting are all calling for the blood of the, you know, uh, I can't remember in the painting if it's thumbs up or thumbs down, which is interesting. That painting is actually where we get the confusion about thumbs up and thumbs down, if I remember my history correctly. But again, we sort of went with uh, the more uh, low-tech uh, gladiator vibe with this one. Uh, again, the Thracian helmet. We've got a physical shield here with uh, sort of a couple sci-fi elements. If you look, right, the armor is clearly a little bit more high-tech, but it's still bare-chested. And I um, I really wanted to get away from uh, the pure gladiator sense here and try to integrate a little bit more more science fiction into it. So this is the concept that my editor and the the Daw sales team, the Penguin sales team, really, and I all sort of settled on. Uh, but I wanted to sort of push back on the genre blending thing a little bit uh, and get more of a sense of Hadrian as a character. Hadrian is not uh, a sort of rough and tumble guy. He's a scholar. He's only fighting. Uh, because he doesn't really have any other prospects early in his life, this being book one. Uh, he has run away from home. He's got nothing left to his name. And so we, I decided rather than uh, uh, pick a distinctive moment in the text that we'd catch a, a feel of the universe and for the character, and I said, why don't we dress him up a little bit more like a nobleman? And so we came uh, much closer. You'll see here towards the, the final concept. The sword here, you'll notice, is still metal. Uh, but we've got a much more refined style of blade. It's not the huge, chunky uh, gladiator weapon anymore. We've got a distinctly Roman breastplate here, the, the Lorica musculata, it would be called the, the you know, the muscly one, uh, for those of you who don't want, uh, don't want the Latin. But you see the sci-fi elements are starting to creep back in. There are uh, lights in his gauntlet here and on the, uh, the belt and the sheath of the blade. Uh, there's something a little bit more modern, a little bit more uh, polished, maybe even Napoleonic in the collar and in the uh, the jacket here and in the, the cut of the, the trousers. But again, you see the classical, the Roman influences in the grief 
here uh, and in the arm guards uh, or the arm guard and the shoulder. This is uh, a manica segmentata that would cover the arm. The Romans would wear these on their weapon arms before uh, armored gauntlets were really a thing. The Romans didn't have, you know, hand armor so much that was going to cover fingers. And so you'd wear these sheets that would come right down to the knuckle line. Um, they weren't terribly common. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, but when you've got that weapon arm forward, you want it as, as covered as you can get. So there's a little bit of that. I actually own one somewhere around here. I haven't uh, unpacked it yet. It's supposed to go with the helmet. I'm assembling a whole set. And um, then it's got these terror gaze, the leather straps, and the shoulder, which you'll see are a little small here. That was one of the edits we went through later. And of course, uh, in the finished cover, there's a helmet again. Uh, more on that in a minute because, uh, of course, we put it back on. We decided to change the posture and get him more looking back up into space. We dropped these moons in the background because nothing says science fiction like more than one moon that helped to communicate a, a sense of the genre as well. The sword starts to glow here. It's no longer just metal. It's uh, it's high matter. There's a sense that this has got uh, something of the lightsaber to it. Uh, the detailing on the armor got a little bit more explicit. The Romans were all about these sort of expressionless human faces on their armor, uh, it's in a lot of traditional cultures, you know, like uh, think about the, the samurai oni mask, right? Where you've got the snarling monster you'd wear. Uh, it was very common to uh, depict monster faces on helmets. The Romans went with a very serene, expressionless human face, which was extremely unsettling. Gods are often depicted without expression, right? Because uh, in sort of the Egyptian sense, the, the gods are supposed to be beyond human, human passions. And though the Roman gods were not, they were frequently depicted uh, that way as sort of an ideal. Uh, you'll see that the terror gaze, the straps got uh, larger here. That was one of my edits, just because I did a lot of editing and so uh, or, or recommended editing. Uh, insofar as the armor was concerned, there's some more equipment that's gotten added under here as well. We sort of chunked up the uh, the science fiction elements and the gauntlets here. And uh, there's still a fin on the helmet. You'll notice that got cut uh, a little bit later on, but we'll, we'll mention that here in a, in a minute. Uh, as far as the helmet returning in the first place, we went back and forth a lot uh, regarding the nature of the face and the hair. And I have a very distinctive vision of Hadrian, and, and I was becoming a little bit too intrusive in the process. This is one of the reasons why it's relatively uncommon for authors to have feedback. I really wanted it to look exactly the way it did in my head, and I felt like I was becoming annoying. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it ended up being a non-issue because Salesforce came in and said, hey, put a helmet on him. We want the reader to sort of see themselves in the character anyway. And so the going back and forth became kind of a moot point. And so we kept moving on a little bit uh, into the next phase. Finally went into color. I asked for them to cut that fin on the helmet just because I don't uh, like the Thracian helmet very much myself. It is, of course, the famous gladiator helmet. I just always thought it looked a little bit goofy. I don't like the uh, Spartan fin that you see on a lot of uh, late Greek helmets as well. Um, I just think it's a bit much. Uh, I like the crests, obviously, the Roman crests. I don't know why I think there's a difference, but I do. And so we just we just lopped it off. And this ended up looking a lot like the helmet from that third second concept photo with the hand holding it uh, came right back around. So a little bit of that concept came back in. Uh, my understanding is that Sam did all the coloring digitally. He went back and, and did this because I actually have the original artwork of this. He did it black and white acrylic. And then he colored it separately and he did some some retouching um, digitally as well. The fog came in. I think that's probably all digital airbrushing. Sam could speak more to the, the details of the technique. But uh, as you can see, there's a sort of overriding sort of color scheme. It's very purple uh, that, you know, gives the book a distinctive uh, color quality on the shelf. Uh, which helps draw the eye. You want something that's not too cluttered, too busy, so that you can pick it out at a distance, right? The hand is still there. Sam wanted some element that was going to interrupt the typical portrait. He, he does a lot of, if you look at his other work, he'll do a lot of like shattered images. He'll do stuff with reflections, a lot of interesting different things. It was really hard with this particular idea to find an element that was going to interrupt the the, the portrait nature of the image. And so we thought that that single evocative hand grabbing the blade spoke to 
some uh, strife, some discord, and to Hadrian's ultimate nature as a conqueror, right, which is where the series is going. Those of you who paid attention to the physical descriptions of armor will notice that this is never an outfit that Hadrian exactly wears, certainly not in book one. His house colors are black and red. They're not white and, uh, and blue, but this does speak to, or white and black, I suppose, but this still speaks to a sense of the universe. You get the Romanness, you get the, this is science fiction, you get the, but this is all also a little bit fantasy. You get the historical groundedness and all of that together. And you know they're going to be swords, uh, which as far as I'm concerned is a huge selling point for me when I'm trying to read stuff. I, I want swords. And so we go from artwork now into cover and that's where we get back to uh, a different person, not the artist anymore. It used to be that publishers had in-house cover designers, people who were on staff who put together covers. These days, a lot of that work has moved freelance because a lot of all work has moved freelance. And so uh, I don't know uh, what the nature of Daw's relationship with their cover designers may be. I think that they uh, hire freelance design companies to do stuff, but they sort of figure out what to do with all of this negative space. So we're talking earlier, Sam very wisely left negative space here around the, uh, you know, the, the, the man in question so that we've got room for the cover and uh, uh, for the title rather, and for the author's name and for quotes and all these things. You want that dead space so that you've got room to slap on the title and, and all of these things. Um, and so we went through a couple permutations of, uh, uh, of text on screen. Uh, you'll notice this one, my name's all on one line. The title's like this. Uh, you know, we've got the uh, the series thing down here below. That's not quite where things ended up on the final, which you saw at the beginning. Um, but we, you know, we, we played around with it a little bit. David Drake's quote showed up. My name's now on two lines. And so we finally moved into the final cover. Uh, as you can see, jumping back real quick, the central figure got a lot larger and we cropped the title a little bit behind it. That gave the cover a sense of dimension, of depth, and, uh, and it allowed us to show the art off in greater detail, you know, much closer, much easier to look at, say, the, uh, the cartouche here on the armor, which is another, the trident with some wings. And so this is how we arrived at the final cover, um, by the sort of negotiated process between me, the editor, the sales team, the artist, all going back and forth. Uh, like I said, I think I got a little bit intrusive in this process, but everyone was extremely, uh, you know, accommodating, uh, willing to listen to me and to the, con and we all had to listen to the concerns of the sales force, right? Put that helmet back on, things like that. And we went back and forth and ended up with what I think is an awesome cover. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of Sam's work. It was an honor and a pleasure to work with him and hope I didn't stress him out too much. <laughs> and so this is sort of the face of the series, right? Uh, book two's got Karn Saga on it. Book three is the Emperor on it. We'll see who shows up on four and five. Uh, but this is uh, really everyone's first look at the Solon Empire, the sort of world we're getting into. It is not the cover that uh, everyone has in the world. The British cover is a little bit different. It's got a much more muted silhouette on a sort of blue-white background. Uh, a different publisher completely uh, wanted to do its own thing with the artwork. Uh, that's very often the case because it's also the case that different markets, in, the, in this case the U.S. versus the U.K., have different aesthetic sensibilities. You want to make sure that the cover that you're designing is marketable to the audience that you're selling to. So if the the British uh, market has certain preferences. Uh, you want to tailor your cover to fit that. But there's also something to be said for universal branding, right? That's why my French publisher, my Russian publisher, went and bought this artwork. They wanted to continue the same sort of aesthetic brand presence across the way, right? Like think about movie posters, right? Star Wars movie posters still have Darth Vader. They still have Luke Skywalker looking like themselves in the poster. Now, part of that's film being a visual medium. It's much easier to make things look consistent, but you don't change the logo except in, in the cases where uh, the language uh, has a different alphabet, for instance. The Japanese Star Wars logo looks a little bit different. But you do want to create the sort of unified image, um, or you that may be what you want to do. That's a choice that you can make, and that's why art might be purchased uh, across publishers. But it's also a reason why my Polish publisher, for instance, did their own cover. They wanted something that fit the Polish market, that uh, that spoke to the you know to the Polish reader. 
And so you want to do something different there. There's all sorts of different strategies, all sorts of different reasons you might choose these things. And so thank you all for taking this look at the cover with me. I hope this cleared up some of the misconceptions, some of the myths about cover design. I hope you enjoyed the look at the art that we never got to use. They were all really awesome. I especially liked that second one with the helmet being held up. And uh, we'd have had quite a different looking series of covers if we'd gone with that motif. One of the coolest things, coolest days to be a writer, is when you get new cover art. It's so cool to see something that you've only ever really imagined in your head come to life in two dimensions, right? And in, in living color, as it were. Really, the, the best days for me are when I get those emails, right? Even if it's just a sketch, right? It's always cool to see what I've imagined, what was playing out in my head, you know, really, really come to life. And so, Sam, if you're watching, it was really awesome uh, working with you, especially this being my first cover. It was, it was a really cool experience. And it's still cool every time I go into the bookstore and, and see, you know, my thing, right, breathed uh, into life by, uh, by someone else. So as always, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please do leave a like. Consider subscribing to the channel. If you haven't checked out my books, a link to that is, as always, in the description. You can check out Empire of Silence or any of the others. On the other hand, if you have read my book, kindly consider leaving a review, especially on Amazon. Every review helps. Uh, thank you, everyone, for reading, for watching this video. I will catch you all again next time. Until then, stay well.